Thank you, Mark. Um, thank you, everybody, for being here tonight, and really appreciate the time and the opportunity to be here. Um, last night, I'm in Milwaukee, and uh, I'm going around to the tables before dinner, meeting everybody and just visiting with them. And I come up to a table and I say, hi, I'm Scott Bowden, your speaker tonight. This lady says, you from the South? I said, yes, ma'am. You're still fighting the war down there, aren't you? And I said, mm, yes, ma'am, we are. She said, why are you doing that? I said, well, because there were these armies of federal soldiers going through the region, <laughs> you know, laying waste to everything, and for over a hundred years there was a lot of economic repercussions of that. I said, that may have something to do with it. And she said, you should have never fired on us. <laughs> and I said, you know, that's exactly what Bob Toombs said to Jeff Davis, you know. But uh, it's funny how people relay that that's what I always wanted to ask somebody is well, you guys really still fight why are you still fighting the war down there well since Last Chance for Victory came out in 2001 um, I've had the privilege uh, before and after that to publish 25 other books but I've, uh, I've always had a lot of requests to talk about Lee at Gettysburg. And um, I've had over 520 talks just on this book. Um, most of them are in the South. You can imagine there's lots of Sons of Confederate Veterans camps, um, United Daughters of Confederacy chapters, and uh, so on and so forth that uh, are very interested in Robert E. Lee. They're very interested in, um, in the, the war as well as in Gettysburg. So in uh, putting together the, the show for tonight, I went about things a little bit differently. Um, I, indeed, I've had some requests to where there was no presentation at all, it was all Q&A. Um, I, I know that you guys had a program on Robert E. Lee 11 months ago, so, and I watched that on YouTube and I w tried to do something that's gonna be a little bit different than that and plus leave a lot of time for uh, questions and answers. So uh, at the end of this thing, if you have any question about Lee, his career, or anything on the Gettysburg campaign, please don't hesitate to throw it my way and I'll do the best that I can not to fumble it, okay? Oh, and by the way, I, I had to mention this last night because I was in Packer territory, but I, I'm not a Cowboy fan. <laughs> Never have been. I had a lot of respect for Tom Landry, but that's where it ended. Okay. Um, this is for those that had the book, uh, and that's another story. The books that I had uh, to give to, for the raffle, as well as the um, flyers for my new Robert E. Lee Award series, those are still in Larry Hewitt's car and, uh, from last night. Larry, bless his heart, got sick, so I'm sorry that none of those made it to tonight's talk. But the cover for his last chance for victory, Robert E. Lee and the Gettysburg Campaign. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the face of Robert E. Lee at the beginning of the war. It was a portrait uh, by Benjamin Franklin Reinhardt that uh, painted that thing in April of 1861, uh, soon after Lee arrived at, uh, in Richmond. It's an impressive portrait. It, it resides at the R.W. Norton Museum in Shreveport. So if any of you folks are ever making it to Shreveport, Louisiana, don't miss the Norton Art Museum because it is one of the jewels of the South. Okay? But this is what Lee looked like. This is what everybody knew him as, um, the handsomest man in the, in the Army, the beau ideal of a soldier as uh, Hancock's wife, Amira said about him. And uh, when um, he uh, finally had a chance, whoops, what we? Erasmus Key, Erasmus Key served with Lee before, you know, in the Antebellum Army as well as against Lee 
as a Corps commander in the Army of, of the Potomac. I think this quote by him is terrific. Um, if I can turn this off now. Okay, good. That he was exempt from every form and degree of snobbery, but his sense of superiority and fitness to command were undeniable. I think that's very important because Lee had this sense of himself that he knew exactly what he was and how good of an officer he was. Okay? This thing by Keyes, no man could stand in his presence and not recognize his capacity and acknowledge his moral force. Interestingly, uh, McClellan said that Lee on the battlefield was worth 40,000 men. There was a statement remarkably similar made by Wellington about Napoleon. Now, when the secession of the southern states um, was in full force, Lee was not a secessionist. Um, he did not believe in it, but uh, eventually, by um, circumstance, he resigned his commission, took up a uh, commission with the Virginia military forces. He was in command of Virginia's military forces. Uh, the flag here of the third, um, of the third Florida kind of summarizes the belief throughout the South that they had the right to secede. It was implied uh, during the um, the ratification con uh, con conferences for the Constitution and even uh, affirmed it by um, Thomas Jefferson's first inaugural address. So with the succession, the armies form and after the victory of Manassas, there is this lull while both sides kind of gathered more troops together. This is a presentation of the first battle flags that was made in the fall of 1861 while Robert E. Lee was on the, um, the southeastern coast as a new department commander. Now the reason that Robert E. Lee did not get an army command early in the year was because of this man, Jefferson Davis. There is a detailed story behind this, one that can go on for over an hour. But the reason that Lee did not get command early is because Jeff Davis was mortal enemies with Winfield Scott. Who was Winfield Scott's protege? Robert E. Lee. Okay? To cut to the chase of the thing that um, uh, Davis, um, who um, still had a close relationship with his former father-in-law, Zach Taylor, um, when reinforcements during the Mexican War that were designated for Zach Taylor's army were diverted by Winfield Scott to his army at Veracruz, Jeff Davis never forgave him for that or anybody associated with, um, uh, with Winfield Scott. So the irony of it is, is that after and, and throughout the, eight, the the 40s and the 50s leading up to the war, there's all these times that Robert E. Lee's and Jeff Davis's paths cross. Okay, and, and every time you can never find one instance where uh, Davis uh, has is is giving him any break none whatsoever. Now you say, well, he was given second in command of the second cavalry when that was formed in the mid-1850s. Yes, but the colonelcy of that went to uh, Jeff Davis's good friend, Sidney Johnston, who was not nearly as qualified to command the regiment as was Robert E. Lee. So the man that Abraham Lincoln would have had lead the uh, principal army of the federal government never got a chance to under Jeff Davis until Davis had no choice but to elevate him to command. And that was when the wounding of Joe Johnston happened on May 31st, 62 at the Battle of Seven Pines. This uh, shows uh, Lee and Davis riding together that night when uh, Davis says that you're gonna have to take command of this, this army. But when Lee ascended to command, it's anything but an army. Lee's general orders that he first issued to everybody has a unique phrase to it. I want you to look at this. Conquer or die. Okay. Lee repeated this 
time and time and time and time and time again in his correspondence. It was his motto. He was not, as Martin Sheen would pro has pro project Lee in the film Gettysburg, as some glassy-eyed, God, it's all God's will stuff. He was very, very determined once he became a revolutionary that they had to do everything they could to win. And this was his motto, and it comes up later, uh, as you will see, when he reorganizes the army. Okay? This army that he gets in early June 62 is just a conglomeration of units that really don't have any morale. The reason they don't have morale is they have no discipline. The reason they don't have any discipline is because the officers don't make the men do anything. In fact, anybody can, if they want to, can go into Richmond at any time they want. They can absent themselves any time they want from the army for any reason. If you think about it, it's a crazy, crazy way to try to run an army that there absolutely is no, no one to answer to because of the, the fabric of Southern society and the way they were putting these units together and the, and the lack of discipline that Joe Johnston had in the Army, half the Army at any time were on the absent rolls. Okay? But when Lee takes command, he has to um, figure out a way to um, expel the Federals that at that time or within five miles of Richmond. And Lee then um, authors what he would do many, many times in his career is these turning maneuvers that comes from his study of the history's great captains. This is a map of the Seven Days campaign where uh, uh, Lee's plan is to you hold the enemy army in your front and you have a, a wing of it that will move into the rear, a uh, part of enforcing the opposition to turn and face you and compromise in their positions. It was one of many, many times that Lee used these turning maneuvers. This painting by Gowan is of John Bell Hood's uh, uh, Texans breaking the, uh, the line in Gaines Mill, Lee's first victory. Uh, he had, interestingly enough, just a couple days later, uh, his battle plan uh, that was at uh, Fraser's Farm in White Oak Swamp was straight out of um, Hannibal Barca's uh, tactical battle plan for his victory at Kane. Lee was very much a self-educated military history guy. His, um, his library was extensive and in preparation for doing the Robert E. Lee at War series uh, years and years ago, I made the commitment to read everything that we know that is documented that was either in Lee's library or that he checked out from the West Point Library. And if you have that basis of knowledge of what he knew, then you can really see these different battles that he planned and where the, and what their origin was. Okay? After the seven days in Richmond is saved, um, he has a conference with Davis Jackson as to what to do with the other Federals that were still in Virginia and north of there under John Pope. That army was called the Army of Virginia. It was a Federal Army. Um, and it was decided uh, after it was determined that McClellan was no longer a threat to Richmond to turn north and get rid of John Pope's guys in northern Virginia. This map shows the essence of the Second Manassas Campaign. Um, you have the Federal Army Corps here and to the north uh, Lee then authors a big turning maneuver, a maneuver sur la derriere, right out of Napoleonic history, to get onto the rear of the lines of communication of the opposition army, thereby maneuvering to create conditions that are favorable for battle. Um, both uh, wings of the army march very well and very fast, and resulting in the Battle of Second Manassas, which uh, Pete Longstreet launches uh, the largest coordinated infantry attack on the North American continent, and it, his tactical implement, implementation of that was uh, uh, straight out of the Battle of Austerlitz in the way and the manner in that which they attacked. Okay, carrying the uh, the Federal line, they were not able to destroy the uh, the Federals there because Jackson's uh, twice did not move after being ordered to do so by Lee. 
But nevertheless, um, after Second Manassas, Lee had a, a series of choices to do. The only logical thing that he could do was continue on into Maryland, even though his army was ill-equipped to do so. So he authors a larger turning maneuver, this one um, that he takes into Maryland, but the federal, uh, pardon me, the federal garrisons are still in his rear back here in the Harpers Ferry and uh, lower uh, valley region. So he detaches Jackson to go back there and clean up the rear areas while they uh, concentrated further to the west, but because fate intercedes and, and a copy of uh, Special Orders 191 falls into McClellan's hands, McClellan has Lee's battle, uh, his operational plan. He pursues and then forces the federal uh, for the Confederates to uh, make a choice to either stand their ground or to retreat in the Sharpsburg area. Lee audaciously chooses to stand. This is a picture of him visiting with um, uh, Gordon Barrett in front of the sunken row. Uh, when Lee made his decision to stand um, in Sharpsburg, he had only 17,000 men on the ground with him. Only 17,000 at the time. And McClellan was piling up across the creek with over 60 at the time. Kind of gives you an idea of just the the determination that he had. Oh, there's a there's a funny story about Lee that you can kind of sense his humor and how he can relate to the relate to the soldiers. Um, it is the the day before uh, Sharpsburg, so it's September 16th, and they uh, they can see the federal armies, you know, arriving hourly, the strength building and building and building and building. And uh, Lee is riding the lines, which he loved to do. And he comes across the Texas Brigade. And uh, one of the guys says, you know, General, do you think they'll attack today? And he says, he says, no, not today. He just said, General McClellan's a very careful man, and he won't come at us today. And then he pauses and says, and besides, if he catches wind of the rumor I sent over last night that we're being reinforced by more Texans, he may not attack at all. <laughs> and that's the kind of humor and, and connection that he had with the guys. It's a great little story and one of many that are related by all kinds of uh, soldiers in the Army of Northern Virginia. But he decides to make a stand once uh, Jackson cleans up um, uh, the mess there at Harpers Ferry and marches to the battlefield, um, and they they have on September 17th, the bloodiest day in American history. Um, these images um, kind of depict uh, just what uh, combat must have seemed like. This uh, attack by and the sacrifice for the Texas Brigade in, the, in Miller's Cornfield is an interesting um, deal that. When they were uh, committed to the battle, in one hand by Jackson to, to counterattack, Jackson at the same time withdrew the Texas Brigade and Hood's division's left flank support in the form of Jubal Early. It's kind of a, uh, a miniature snapshot of how Jackson was so erratic with his tactics. He operationally, he got it, but with tactically, he was very, very erratic. And um, he wasn't anything like Longstreet that knew how to handle uh, troops on the battlefield in a much in a much better way than Jackson did. Uh, this in, this uh, image of Longstreet and his staff serving uh, one of the guns of the Washington artillery at that battle is good. At the end of the day, Lee has this conference with his generals to decide: Do we stay or do we go? And um, he decides to dragnet all the areas behind the army to make sure that we get all the stragglers up in line and he presents the army again the next day. McClellan doesn't attack because he's out of ammunition for all his 20-pounder parrots rifles. He said that since he doesn't have artillery superiority, he decides not to attack. Lee then slips away the next day. Now in the reorganization of the army that follows, um, Lee at last can make this army his own. In the, in the time before when he <coughs> ascended to command until October of 1862, he's had to 
on the fly reorganize this army and, and try to mold it into a fighting machine that he would have wanted to do had he been in command from the get-go. Okay? So he reorganizes the forces and in the process of doing that, he implements this uh, presentation of the pincushion. Okay? Now here is a replica of the pincushion. You say, what in the world is this all about? Okay? See, by Confederate law, Robert E. Lee had no authority to promote anybody. So, he could see the most bravest action on the battlefield, and he was always, especially in the early campaigns, always under fire. Second Manassas, he almost got killed when um, a federal bullet grazed his cheek. Yeah, he, looked like, he said it looked like a lipstick um, mark on it when he came back from his reconnaissance saying, look, a federal, uh, a federal soldier almost killed me right just now. So he was always uh, seen in front of the action, assessing the, the troops, and one of the things that he did was implement this presentation of the pincushion to deserving officers and men. Now, when he was first placed in command, he had sent to the Cincinnati area some Confederate gold and uh, a plan for the, um, the Copperheads in the Cincinnati area to manufacture these pincushions. And this is what it looked like on the facing, on the front side, it had the first national flag, it said conquer or die, Lee's motto. And on the back, it's got a scroll that says love and it's framed by roses from Mary's Rose Garden at Arlington House, okay? So, um, during the reorganization, uh, after the staff had done its work and they know who the deserving guys are almost on a regimental basis. The boss rides into t uh, the camp unannounced as he always did from the day he first took command. He loved impromptu inspections. Okay, Rides into camp, the deserving soldiers are called out, he gives them the thanks for serving the cause and uh, hands them the pin cushion. And uh, I regret that I don't have a, one of them with me. Um, I have had many, uh, hundreds of these made. And every time I go to a UDC event, it doesn't matter how many I've got, they always sell out. But these, these pin cushions were about this size, and this is what they looked like. And you can imagine that a soldier or an officer receiving one of these things was very proud. And what do you think they would do with them? What do you think would they do with a pincushion? Send it home. Send it home. Send it home. <laughs> See, you would send it home to your mom, your sister, your loved one. Okay? Look what, look what General Lee gave me. Okay? And so, in one act, Lee does many things. He gives hope and encouragement to the enemies of the Lincoln administration. Okay. He, uh, he ties the men closer to him by giving them recognition and promotion through the proper ranks because if you uh, ha single somebody out, you know they're going to get promoted. Okay. And lastly, he gets the support of the women on the home front when this thing hits. Okay? And there's some wonderful letters uh, written by, letter, by Lee and others that talk about this thing and uh, what it meant to them. But uh, hopefully, no one has told you about this little story about Lee and the pincushions before, but it's one of the important things that he did in, um, in bonding with the men. Okay. After that, we got the Fredericksburg campaign that was fought during the winter months. Um, the, the image here of Lee uh, in the front lines is one that is uh, typical with the way he commanded the army. Um, at, at Fredericksburg, they repulsed, the, as you guys know, the, um, the federal attacks, but it wasn't a kind of victory that they wanted because there was no way to maneuver and get at the Federals to inflict grievous losses. They can't trade bodies two for one. They want to do, Lee wants to do something far more dramatic. 
So even though with the victory uh, at Fredericksburg, Lee knows this is not the kind of victory he needs to have. And so as the early spring of 63 comes in, his army is starving to death. They have to disperse part of it just for uh, so they can subsist. And so when the subsequent campaign begins at Chancellorsville, he's without the First Corps under Pete Longstreet. This image of Jackson and him planning the flank attack at, at Chancellorsville uh, is famous. Lee decides to split his arm, numerically inferior army into two and uh, send Jackson on the flank mark out here on the federal right and uh, while he holds with his smaller force here, Jackson attacks through the woods. Uh, he has significant success. It could have been a lot more if his tactical deployments had been a lot better. But nevertheless, they drive the Federals uh, into uh, back to uh, United States Fort here and Salem Church back here. And as a result of the campaign, Robert E. Lee is hailed as a great captain. Um, he was obviously saddened by the loss of Jackson, but with the loss of Jackson, he has to reorganize the army again. So in that reorganization, he keeps his staff the same size, even though Confederate law has recently been changed in April so he can expand it. He decides to keep it the same. Longstreet commands the First Corps. We'll have Dick Yule handpicked by Stonewall Jackson to command the second. And Powell Hill, uh, known as AP Hill also, will div five division commander will, will um, command the third corps, the new corps. Okay? They'll take bits and pieces of units here and there to pitch this thing together. But at this time, it was believed that Powell Hill would be the best choice for Corps Command. Uh, obviously, Jeb Stewart was kept in command of the Confederate Cavalry. This review uh, was just shortly before the campaign began. Now, when Lee decides, or it is decided that Lee would head north again in the wake of the Chancellorsville campaign, he authors another turning maneuver by uh, leaving the line along the Rappahannock and then moving into Maryland and Pennsylvania on a big, uh, turning maneuver that would hopefully steal a march on the Federals that would have to follow up after them and it was Lee's hope that in the process of stealing the march and then being able to pick and choose where to fight to uh, pick off the Federals piecemeal he would have a singular victory that could affect the politics and the outcome of the war. Um, the detachment of Jeb Stewart and his cavalry from Lee's army is one of the um, um, big controversies of this campaign. The the route that Lee was to ta that Stewart was to take when he departed was um, scouted by this man, John Singleton Mosby, who's a very capable uh, scout, and uh, the idea that Mosby came up with was straight out of Napoleon's campaign at Marengo. And it would be that um, part of the army would shoot up in the gaps between widely separated enemy forces, steal a march, and when it was presented to Robert E. Lee, he loved it. So under the provisions of carefully worded orders, uh, Stuart was to detach, but if he ran into trouble, he was to double back and go up into Pennsylvania another way. Now, the orders for Stuart's detachment were written by this guy. This is Charles Marshall, uh, one of the nephews of uh, John Marshall, former Chief Justice of the United States. Um, Charles Marshall's um, wordings to um, Stuart um, have been criticized by some. It was Marshall that wrote all the after action reports for General Lee. Um, now he graduated at the age of 18 with a master's degree. He graduated magna cum laude from um, Virginia, University of Virginia in, with English. 
So he, he knows the English language pretty well. He issues the orders to uh, Stewart. He also goes and tells him personally what he's to do. Stewart detaches, uh, but almost immediately he runs into trouble. But rather than double back like he's supposed to, he even separates himself further from the army until he's not in contact with Lee at all. Um, eventually, they will get back to Confederate lines, but that is more than a week later. And as Lee, as Stewart, is uh, riding through Maryland and Pennsylvania, the rest of the army is crossing the Potomac, as well as Ewell's forces reach as far north as Carlisle Barracks. But in the meantime, it's come to Lee's attention through a scout named Harrison that uh, was employed by Longstreet that the Federals were now in pursuit. Uh, Lee decides that it's, we need to concentrate the Army. He, um, he gives the orders to Powell Hill to uh, coordinate the location of the concentration, either at Cashtown or at Gettysburg, and Powell Hill decides that they'll concentrate at Gettysburg. So when uh, Lee comes upon uh, Powell Hill at the Cashtown Inn, they can hear gunfire up ahead on July 1st, Lee wanting to know, what, first of all, what in the world are you doing here? And, and, and not at the front. And then secondly, with Dick Anderson's division coming behind him, he decides, the boss decides to ride on to the front to find out what's happening. Um, at that, um, at that uh, meeting engagement, we got Confederates coming in from the west and from the north. Uh, the, the Federals are coming up from the south and from the east. And uh, with that meeting engagement, with that maneuvers come opportunity. The Confederates have significant opportunity that day because of the timely arrival by Second Corps units under Ewell. And uh, the, the line also assailed in the front uh, at where the First Corps is in front of the, uh, the seminary uh, on Seminary Ridge here as well as the flanking attack made by Jubal Early's guys along here on Barlow's Knoll. Uh, the federal line is completely dislodged and uh, they're hurled back towards uh, through town onto the heights beyond. This is kind of a picture of when the federal line in the, uh, was broken and just how close Harry Hayes and Avery's brigades were uh, here on the outskirts of town to where the the heights are right there, okay? Now, uh, first arriving on the scene to see what kind of a mess this is that was sent up by me is Hancock. <coughs> Pardon me. Hancock said that uh, had the Confederates just pursued any time within an hour after they broke the, the Federal line, they would have carried and swept away everybody on that hill. Um, uh, the artillery chief of First Corps uh, Federal First Corps said the same thing. He said he expected to be uh, picked up and go to a Richmond prison camp almost at any time. But Lee sees the same thing. He sees the disorder that the Federals are in. So he sends this guy. Who know, you know who this guy is? Well, that's Walter Taylor. Okay? And he was Lee's original ADC uh, when he was first... Uh, uh, got his first job uh, in with the Virginia military forces, and he was uh, Lee's longest standing ADC. He sends he sends um, he sends Taylor to General Ewell with this simple message: It is only necessary to press those people in order to gain possession of the heights. You will are to take them for practical, and ever since about the last. 60 to 70 years, historians have obsessed to the ridiculous <laughs> over this phrase, ignoring this. What does this say? If you're in a hierarchical organization and, a, and somebody comes to you from the boss and says, it is only necessary for you to do this in order for us to do get that. What do you think he just told you to do? He gave you an order. 
as Walter Taylor says, it was typical of all orders. The, the recipient had the discretion as to how to implement the orders. Okay? But this has been warped by present day uh, historians, most of them, into um, it being a what they call a discretionary order simply because Lee, as a Tidewater gentleman, and as uh, typical of a gentleman of this period, north or south, ending a request with a polite phrase. Okay? But clearly the message was that you were to try, and Taylor knew that, and so did Ewell. Uh, and Taylor goes back to the boss and says, okay, you know, he's, uh, he says that he, he understands what he's supposed to do. In the meantime, <clears throat> from Ewell comes one of his ADCs almost immediately on the heels of Taylor arriving. Here comes James Power Smith back to Lee saying, uh, Ewell wants to know if you got any help from us from Third Corps. And uh, Lee says, well, I've already ordered Parson Pendleton. Well, he didn't call him Parson. He, 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 Longstreet called him Parson Pendleton. I call him Parson Pendleton. But he said, yeah, I've already ordered General Pendleton put artillery fire on that hill. And that will be the support that we can give from Third Corps. Um, go back and tell General Ewell. And James Power Smith says his orders were like, General Lee directed me to return to Ewell with the order order to take Cemetery Hill if it were possible. Okay? Once again, ladies and gentlemen, what does this indicate? It indicates that you are to what? You are to try. Okay? But you'll, for whatever reason, um, probably because of the force of personality of Jubal Early, did not try. And, um, you know, Rhodes was sick as well that day. And as a result, the Federals uh, solidified their position, and the next morning, the, the Federals are in position behind Gettysburg along Cemetery Hill and Cemetery Ridge. Okay? So, with Lee's army still concentrating, he still has the initiative. And he wants to maintain the initiative, so he decides to pivot the plan implemented at um, Chancellorsville. And instead of rolling up the, the federal left, we're going to roll up their right, which is their as their most operational, most sensitive flank, sensitive flank. We're going to send Longstreet on a uh, a march to the south side of the field, and then he was to attack the federal left, roll it up this way from south to north. Uh, once Longstreet gets into position, uh, the the uh, positions of the Federals had changed. Lee was on the spot and he issued uh, modified orders for an attack on Echelon, which was a standard um, method by which uh, the Confederates attacked beginning the first battle they ever fought under Lee at Mechanicsville. It was an institutionalized memory thing that the Army had. Everybody knew how to attack on Echelon, meaning in steps one goes, the next goes, the next goes, so on and so, so on and so forth, depending upon if you're going to author it from the left or from the right or from the center. But in the meantime, uh, Meade is uh, having to deploy his guys and get them ready to fight Bobby Lee. He uh, goes and visits Dan Sickles, who moved out uh, from Cemetery Ridge without orders into the, uh, the Peach Orchard um, assailant. Uh, at the same time, uh, John Bill Hood is uh, pleading with Longstreet to not let him even move further around to the south, around the big round top, which you see right there, as opposed to, there's the little round top. Uh, Hood wanted to even extend his march even further, but Longstreet says, no, the boss says it's on, and we've got to attack. Besides, you don't have time to do this long and, and diversionary um, a march around the side. There's not enough daylight for that, so we got to do it. We got to go now. So Hood kicks off the battle about four o'clock. He's attacking from his right to his left, as this map indicates. Uh, the first Texas uh, is part of the uh, attack that takes uh, Houck's Ridge, and from Houck's Ridge you can look across the Valley of Death to Little Round Top. 
and from Little Round Top, you could look back across the Valley of Death to um, to Hawks Ridge, which is uh, right there. Um, and the Confederates continue uh, by this time to press forward because uh, Hood has been uh, Hood has been seriously wounded. The direction of the um, the division kind of falls apart, even though they start struggling up the slopes of Round Top. There's this uh, tremendous battle at the far end of the line between the 15th Alabama and the 20th Maine, which you can see right there up at the top. But that is, in essence, a sideshow compared to what's going on in the center, where Longstreet is maintaining control over the advance of uh, the other units under Hood, as well as Lafayette McClaws' division which he does very well. Um, the attack continues to move up the line until it moves into McClaws' division. The, um, the charge of McClaws, uh, Barksdale's Mississippians breaks um, the, third, the Federal Third Corps line there at the uh, Peach Orchard, the Sherfy House area. As, and then the Confederates uh, under the Wilcox, uh, they, uh, they get all the way onto the um, uh, base of Cemetery Ridge or close to it before they're stopped by some federal heroics. In the meantime, uh, the, the attack continues up the line into Dick Anderson's uh, division until it falls apart by the time it gets up uh, to Rand's Wright's brigade. You can see there when Posey loses control of his brigade, and uh, Billy Mahone's Virginians are right here, and up right there is Dorsey Pender's Light Division waiting for the battle to roll northward so they can continue the attack in this way. Now, the reason, one of the reasons that Lee wanted to attack on Echelon is it gives the opportunity to the opposing commander to make lots of mistakes. And in this case, uh, as uh, Longstreet is doing so well down on the south end of the field, uh, Meade is sending more and more federal troops to the south end of the field, denuding the center part of the line where the attack is rolling to. Okay, But as the attack gets to its critical point right here, as Rand's right uh, goes up and crests Cemetery Ridge, Posey fails, Mahone uh, is insubordinate, and when uh, Dorsey Pender uh, sees this, he rides over to the right of his division and he is then mortally wounded by a, a federal fragment. Robert E. Lee, after the battle, says the turning point was that if Pender had remained in his saddle 30 minutes longer, we would have won the day. Uh, in the meantime, there's some action on the far left of the line on Culp's Hill. And as evening draws to a close, uh, the Confederates launched an attack uh, against Cemetery Hill, but instead of going all in like you should, uh, Jubal Early only sends two brigades, the Louisianans and the North Carolinians. This image of Harry Hayes' Louisiana Brigade capturing the batteries up on the summit. But because there's no support, the attack with recedes, with Dorothy, Dorsey Pender's uh, attack not going in, and the Receives and the fighting, the infantry fighting for the night is done. But that's not all that was done for that night because about 11 o'clock, uh, Stewart made his way back uh, to see the boss after being gone for eight days. Um, the uh, uh, when the battle had ended the first day, July 1st, Lee had gotten together riders of the First Maryland Cavalry Battalion to go out on all the roads to find Stuart to bring him to Gettysburg. Uh, one of those riders from the 1st Maryland found Stuart at Carlisle, and so in a twist, um, uh, it was Robert E. Lee that found Stuart rather than vice versa. And Stuart makes it to Gettysburg. Um, the meeting between uh, he and Lee took place about 11 o'clock that night. Uh, the next day, Lee plans to continue the battle because there are logistical considerations as well as political ones to consider, as well as military ones. I mean, the first two days, uh, the Army of Northern Virginia has inflicted about 20,000 casualties on the Federals. They know 
these numbers. Lee, in the meantime, has suffered about 12 to 13,000. So even on a disjointed attack, he's inflicting casualties at a five to three rate. He thinks that, well, if we can just get on the same page with everybody, we can have success. So he comes up with an initial plan to attack and hold the Federal's attention on the Confederate left under Yule while he puts together a, a, an attack that will supposedly go in early on the 3rd. But that doesn't happen. Um, the guys on the Confederate left sacrifice themselves, but there's no attack happening on the center front. And the reason for that is that Longstreet, um, after his very successful fight, um, the second is not bought in at all with continuing the attack on the third. So Lee decides that he will reconnoiter the federal line uh, to see what alternate plan can be put together. And in that alternate plan, he decides to cobble together um, an attack that would try to break the federal center along the cemetery ridge line. Now, um, for you guys that have seen that film, Gettysburg, you know, there's one of these one of these scenes where Martin Sheen rides into the midst of all these Confederates before the attack on July 3rd and they all go nuts. You know, we, we, we know that that was not a scripted uh, scene for the film, but the camera guys were there when Sheen rode into this area and all the reenactors decided to, uh, to give him, you know, um, the salute. Well, there's what what's interesting about that 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 is, even though it was not intended, that has a, a very solid basis in history. Okay, because as Lee is reconnoitering the line, he's talking to Harry Heath, uh, George Pickett, and Pete Longstreet about this proposed attack that they're going to have on the third, and um, um, Pickett and Longstreet both have significant reservations about it. And Lee says, well, ask them as they're riding, they're, they're almost riding right in front or right near uh, Kemper's Brigade. He says to Pickett, well, just ask the men. Ask the men if they, if they can do it. And so they hear, the, the guys hear this, and in this wild affirmation of, yes, General Lee, we can do this, we will, many of us will die, but yes, we will do this. And there's some great stories that were connected with this, with this story. Lee then says, we're going to go, we're going on with this thing. Because the men believe we can do it, and properly led, they can do anything. That was his belief. He organizes artillery bombardment, uh, the key of which was not as much the guns that were in front of Cemetery Ridge, but the ones that were going to be on the oblique coming from the Second Corps, and once again, that was supposed to be put in by uh, General Pendleton, but Pendleton woefully fails in his mission on July the 3rd as well. Uh, Pickett fires up his guys to go, and off they cross, uh, some of them uh, a mile from the Federal line, other ones started about 800 yards. You remember that image of John Bell Hood breaking the, the the federal line at Gaines Mill, he had 800 yards to cross on that attack. These guys, a lot of them with a tremble, uh, coming across from the way up on the upper uh, Seminary Ridge, they had over 1,600 yards to cross in open ground. Okay, so on they come. It's a good image of uh, after they pass the Kadori Farm the brigades of Pickett that are getting ready to crest the ridge. is an image of Garnett right there, routing his guys right before they make the last push, and into the teeth of the federal artillery and uh, defenses they come. Uh, Lewis Armistead leading his brigade at the moments before he was mortally wounded. To his left uh, elements of the Pickett or the Trimble and uh, uh, attack, they make it as far as the Bryan farmhouse. When you go there, you can still see that uh, farmhouse and it gives you an idea 
just how close the Confederates got there, but they, by the time they got there, they were so shot up, they didn't have really any formations left. Just a few color bearers and the guys around them. When it's over, as the survivors are crossing the uh, field back to Confederate lines, you know, Robert E. Lee was the first one to recognize that it was his fault that he did not lead the attack. Leading meaning he did not organize the attack. Um, because it had not been implemented properly, they, he knew from what his staff members were bringing back that guys that were supposed to advance never did. And uh, so, you know, he carried the weight of that for, and he carried it very heavily for, for several weeks until he tendered his resignation to Jeff Davis. Um, offering to um, step down if somebody, if Davis wanted somebody else. This image of the captured Confederates at Gettysburg um, kind of symbolizes the, the last desperate attempt that Lee had to correct all the reverses that had been thrown to the Confederates prior to him finally getting a chance uh, to command that lost year that he had in 1861 when he did, wasn't in command, kind of finally came back on them at Gettysburg when uh, it, it, all the desperate chances that he did take and did take on that field and took before then, this, this image kind of sums it all up. In the retreat, Lee is a brilliant, and uh, his retreat from Gettysburg is one of his um, best operations that he ever had. But in the end, um, he understood that there, it was the last realistic chance that he had for victory was in that, in that Pennsylvania gambit. And this image kind of sums it all up. No longer that, that dark-haired guy from 1861, but a man who looks like um, Hey, that he has shouldered the responsibility and the hopes of a republic for, two, for uh, just over a year. And you can see how much it aged him. Um, once again, we look at this image, we think of Lee. When I think of Lee, I, th I see this image. Because he was a guy that modeled himself on the great captains and he was one that uh, had implemented things that uh, no other American officer dared do in that war or in, in a lot of them up until modern wars never attempted to either. This is a brochure. I didn't, uh, there, the brochures are in Larry's car. <laughs> uh, uh, but this is a front and back of the brochure of the new Robert Lee War series. Um, uh, the next volume of which is called um, Hope Arises from Despair. And all you got to do, if you're interested in signing up to get all the notices about it, <coughs> excuse me, you go to leeatwar.com and it just asks you to register. All you got to do is put your email in and the publisher will keep you up to date on everything that's happening. Now hopefully, I did not take too much time, uh, and I did. Uh, <laughs> Uh, going over this stuff real quickly. I tried to do something different than maybe you had seen before on Gettysburg. Um, didn't really sink a, a deep down into any one thing simply because there are dozens and dozens of subjects that can you can spend an hour, hour and a half on. So I'd like to open it up for questions. Anything you got with regards to his career or this, I'd be very happy to uh, try to answer as best I can. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Exactly what he was thinking and what he was trying to accomplish. Hey, you might hear that. Why did Why did Lee not put down on paper? Uh, why did he synthesize, uh, you know, his command and uh, command structure and his thoughts, his art of war, things like that? The answer is, is he was too busy trying to mold this army into an army. Um, I kind of really brushed over it, but by the time he takes command of the army. 
the only way that he can communicate properly to everybody just how serious this business is is to is to go into the camps on a daily basis and to reiterate to everybody just what needs to be done and so Lee on on June the 2nd June 3rd 1862 two days after his ascension to command he starts this routine where um, early in the morning and late in the afternoon he is reconnoitering the lines and all through the middle of the day he is is inspecting the camps and visiting with the men and I don't think he has the time to do what so many of the federal officers had the luxury of doing so you had George McClellan that had months and months and months to craft the army exactly how he wanted it to be and that was built around this massive siege train because George McClellan was going to take Richmond like the French and the British took Sevastopol in the Crimean War, which he had reported on in a congressional document. Okay, and that was his whole plan. So Lee never had the opportunity to write as others did, and the reason is that he's too busy trying to build this army on the fly, and uh, he is always trying to catch up. It's always a game of catch up, catch up, catch up with Lee until it. It, it's too late to catch up. Yes, sir. You know, um, the command decisions uh, by Lee, we know that Stuart performed really, really well at, at uh, Chancellorsville when he took over um, for Jackson. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that he never promoted Stuart to become an infantry leader or one of the leaders of his corps? I think it's a good quick question. How come after Chancellorsville did Lee not put Stuart in command of 2nd Corps um, or 3rd Corps? Well, we know that Jackson hadn't picked Ewell, right? And it was believed at the time that Powell Hill could handle that real well. Now, we certainly know that Powell Hill was a miserable failure, okay? Um, and See, even, even though Stewart had done very well uh, in his ride around McClellan, he had done a lot of little things that had really uh, irritated Lee, okay? Uh, like after Malvern Hill, when they got to the, the Berkeley 100 and uh, the Federals are languishing down in the low ground, Stewart calls for Longstreet's infantry to come up to capture the key piece of high ground that would have commanded the entire federal army and really would have made it very difficult for uh, McClellan, okay? But rather than rather than simply wait for Longstreet to get there, he opens up with two guns from uh, Pelham's battery that alerts the federals, hey, you know, that, that, that piece of ground up there is pretty important. We better go get that from him. You know, little <laughs> things like that that are repeated several times. They're repeated again after Second Manassas when Lee is trying to author another maneuver at Chantilly to get behind Pope's line of communication. They're almost there, almost there, almost there, and then Stewart opens up with artillery for no reason. That irritated him. Uh, at, um, uh, at Sharpsburg, the same thing happened when uh, late in the day Lee was interested in getting Jackson to do a maneuver that was on the far Confederate left. Uh, they were underway when uh, Stuart once again opens up with artillery to announce the fact that they are in motion when there was no reason to do that. That irritated Lee too. Okay, there's other things. They're north in the uh, the Maryland campaign. Um, after he withdraws from Sharpsburg and goes back into Virginia, Lee is immediately going to continue the campaign by going marching up river and recrossing at Williamsport. He sends Stewart up there to do that. As, Stewart, as soon as Stewart crosses over there, he uh, not only holds a ball to, to, you know, to play with the ladies there, okay? <laughs> he also has his artillery guys do some other silly things like firing on federal pickets. That, allow, that announces to McClellan miles away that, oh, that, you know what, Bobby Lee's not finished with this campaign. And so, you know, McClellan sends a whole corps down there to deal with that thing. 
So these little bitty things like that, that nobody ever talks about, had to have in Lee's mind given him enough reservation to where he wasn't prepared to do that uh, to Stewart and such a big responsibility. Now, in hindsight, maybe they'd have been a lot better off if Third Corps would have been under Jeb Stewart and Wade Hampton would have taken the cap. But at the time that he was making those decisions, I can understand why he did not do that. Yes, sir. You spoke of the uh, animosity between Jefferson Davis and Lee. Do you think that uh, Lee's stock rose directly because of the animosity that developed between Jefferson Davis and Beauregard? Okay, the question was um, um, Lee's, Lee not being a Davis favorite. Did Lee's stock rise when Beauregard's stock fell? All right? Uh, the answer is no. Okay? Um, see, when, when Lee is sent to Western Virginia to coordinate those three clowns that were out there <laughs> commanding the Confederates, okay? Jefferson Davis sent him out there without command authority, which is was in the papers at the time. But it's strange that that authors today, historians, oh, they don't they don't bother to mention that small fact. He didn't have command authority. That's why when he gets out there, he's doing what? He's giving suggestions because he cannot give orders. Okay, and um, he when he's on the road out there. He d writes a letter to his wife that says, you know, if anybody had told me that I'd be on this road, on this mission that I'm on, I'd think them to be insane. That's what he thought of his mission. And then when he returns to Richmond after the failed Virginia campaign, and he's sent to command this department down in the Atlantic coast that, to do anything that a junior engineer officer could do, he writes a letter to his daughter that says, this is man, this is worse than the before. You know, this is, this is even a, a, a bigger folly. He uses stronger language, even with his daughter. But he knew what the deal was. And then, but when things got so bad for the Confederates, and things are unraveling in the West at alarming speed, Henry, Donaldson, Nashville, um, Island number 10, Memphis getting ready to fall, New Orleans already has fallen. Things are coming apart at the seams. The uh, Federals are incurring, uh, having these incursions up, up and down the Atlantic coast. Things are bad, bad, bad. It's going to end in the 62, this dream of independence. The Confederate Congress finally tells Davis, if you don't get Robert E. Lee in here to be the commanding general of the armies, you know, we're done. And so they convince uh, Davis to order Lee back to Richmond under the belief that he will be the commanding general of the armies. And the Confederate Congress passes the order, passes the act to have the commanding general of the armies have control of control of the war effort. Okay? Under the belief that Lee will be nominated by the president to once they pass this thing to be um, to be that officer now Lee Lee under instructions from Davis comes back to town okay and Davis returns the bill unsigned to Congress and he sends a letter to the, the House um, House of Representatives uh, the, the Speaker of the House telling him that you know, there's no need for me to sign this. Number one, it encroaches on my constitutional um, authority, which it did not. But that's what he claimed. He could claim anything. And uh, secondly, <clears throat> I just want to let you know I'm going to take care of Lee. He's coming back. We're, I'm going to put him in a position where, you know, he's going to make a difference, you know. <clears throat> so, under that ruse, he undermines the potential veto override. And so the bill is shelved until when? January of 65. When it resurrects, when things are so god-awful bad, then yes, then finally it passes, then finally Lee's put in charge when it doesn't matter a hoot. 
uh, who's in charge at that point in time. Okay, so Jeff Jeff Davis never did anything to, in his mind, to raise Lee stock once Beauregard got flushed down the the, the, the toilet in the summer of '61 until Davis was forced to do so with the wounding of retreating Joe Johnston. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, two questions. Uh, one is that I had read or heard somewhere, and I have no idea where it was, that we were still at Gettysburg. True or false? Secondly, would you, would you like to comment on your take on Lee's relationship with Longstreet and Longstreet's performance under Lee? Okay. Two questions. Was Lee sick at Gettysburg? And to uh, Longstreet and Lee's relationship. Well, good questions. Um, Lee acknowledged in April of '63 that he had had some kind of health event, and I think we got to take the guy at his word. You know, if he says so, we got to believe it. Now, how did that affect him in the field? Did he make these crazy decisions? That I mean, there's there's one or two authors out there today that says because he had a heart attack in April, he loses his mind on three days in July, but he's good all the other time. <laughs> now, if you want to believe that, this is America, you have freedom to do so. Okay? But, uh, and they, they think that because Lee is not riding the line like an infantry captain, making sure that every brigade does what they're supposed to do, that he is sick. Well, that, what Lee's doing is is modeling a long, long, long battle line on on the typical command structure of the time is that you got to pick a central point to let all the people know where to find the boss in case they need him, okay? And that's what he did for July 2 and for July 3 as well. So was he not up to his pre-April 63 stamina and activity? You can make the argument that it was. However, Lee, you see his activities during the day, and, and one of the things in the Robert Lee at War Time, um, Robert Lee at War series I'm doing is putting a timeline by battle and all of his activity and all of his decisions. And at Gettysburg, you only see uh, the the time that is not when he's active and riding all over the field and making things, is when it's actually under, when there's something is actually underway and then you can make the argument that it's because of, of the, a, the annuated line that the Confederates have. He, he's got to maintain a central position, okay? So, I don't think it affected his mental capacity. If it affected his physical uh, capacity or his physical activity, well, you know, he was extraordinarily fit as a physical specimen, okay? He had more endurance in his mid-50s than Jackson had in his late 30s, okay? He was, I mean, Jackson would give out after a day or so, Lee could go for three days, okay? So men are different, and women too, on how they can maintain their physical activities and how long they can stay with it. No difference now, no difference then. Um, insofar as uh, Lee and Longstreet's relationship are concerned, um, Longstreet, let's make no mistake about this, Longstreet was by far the best battlefield general that Lee had. Okay? Um, he proved himself in the seven days at Gaines Mill again at Frazier's Farm, um, at Second Manassas, his attack at Second Manassas uh, did not achieve what it did not achieve, what it was hoped to achieve because of Jackson uh, it was very tardy on the two direct orders that Lee had given him to move. Longstreet's defensive performances at um, Sharpsburg and at um, Fredericksburg are were excellent. Um, his attack the second day at Gettysburg, you can, make, you can make the argument that that was the best performance by any Corps commander on any field at any time, north or south, during the war. You can make that argument. Okay? Um, but I think that Lee recognized that on July 3rd, it was his fault for not taking command of the whole thing because he could see 
early in the morning. And it was, if anybody wanted to say that where Lee's health may have come into it, it may have at that point in time where he maybe didn't think that he was up to it to put everything together on July 3rd that needed to be put together. But with Longstreet given command of Powell Hills guys, anything on the right side of Gettysburg was under the orders uh, of James Longstreet. As, and what happened on July 3rd, I think Lee certainly was disappointed in that, but I think Lee also recognized that he was to blame for not, not taking the reins of something like that. So uh, when it comes time to detach Longstreet to the west, uh, Lee sends his best because he doesn't believe the Federals are in shape for any kind of serious campaigning and he can handle it with Dick Ewell and Powell Hill. Um, when Longstreet comes back, um, he's wounded right away. And uh, I, the way I take the whole uh, thing it, and as one is that, is that Lee believes that in a tactical setting, Longstreet is unmatched by anybody. I believe that Lee also thought that on an operational level that Jackson had nobody that was his equal. Okay, So it was almost like you have two stars on your team, one that can handle the dirty work, the other one that understands the larger picture and what has to be done. Okay. And but as far as his relationship with Longstreet, I think it was very solid. That's why when you see the army getting reorganized in April of, of October of '62, uh, Lee makes it very clear in orders that Longstreet is the principal subordinate or the number one subordinate, and Jackson is number two. And all that comes from what he had observed up until that time. Those are good questions. Yes, sir? Could you comment a little bit on uh, Lee's motivations in undertaking this campaign? I know there's a you know, debate back and forth by historians about whether he should have even undertaken such a campaign. Okay, that's a good question. Uh, uh, could I go into uh, Lee's thinking on undertaking the Gettysburg campaign and what, was, uh, what were the underpinnings or the influencing factors, right? Okay. You know, when in the wake of Jackson's death, they had this four-day conference in Richmond, um, like the 10th through the 14th, somewhere around there, you know. Four-day conference between Lee, President Davis, and the cabinet members. And there's all this debate as to, well, do we detach guys to the West to try to save this Vicksburg horrendous mess out there. Is there enough time to do that? And Joe Johnston had already been detached on by the train to uh, Jackson, Mississippi to try to put together some kind of relief force uh, for General Pemberton. Okay. While that four-day conference is going on, okay, news comes from Johnston that he's arrived in Jackson and there's nothing to be done but to retreat and that he's burned the railheads. Now, why is that so important, okay? They can't get supplies more than a day's march off of any railhead. They don't have the logistical support lift. They don't have the logistical lift to go off any railhead by more than, more than a, a, day's, a couple days march. That means you cannot organize a relief for Vicksburg if the railheads at Jackson are gone. So the issue was dis determined right then, right there. Historians talking today, guys talking on the post-it notes, internet, yak sites about uh, they could have saved, they could have saved, you know, Pemberton and this Vicksburg thing are out their minds. You know, that you can't, you can't, you have to fight the war logistically, okay? And a lot of people don't understand the logistics behind the decisions. Now, with the, Vicks, with the Vicksburg thing solved, what do we do in Virginia? Well, Northrop, who was the commissary of subsistence, 
had already told, made the report at this time, at this meeting, that they could not supply enough food and fodder to feed the army and the army animals if they remained on the Rappahannock during the month of June. Well, gee whiz, what do we do? We sure can't stay here, can we? What else can we do? We can't retreat. We can't reinforce the West. We got to go again, north. And that's where Jeff Davis failed in not fully supporting the gambit by giving Lee all the troops that he asked for over and over and over and over again. And you can make all kinds of what if scenarios if it had the other two brigades of Pickett's division been there, had that entire division of Bob Ransom been there under uh, Longstreet for day two, you know, we, we will never know. But we do know that the loss of those and the absence of those 11,000 men weighed very heavily in what transpired, you know, in, in the fields of Mississippi. Yes, Mrs. Jackson. What if Jackson would have been there? Okay. Um, you really want to hear this? Okay. You know, Jackson was an eccentric genius, right? And he and Lee had a common vision on how to prosecute the war. Uh, that common vision was the further the army was away from Richmond, the safer Richmond was. And that was true. It was right out of Hannibal's strategy of, in the Second Punic War. You don't defend Carthage by forming an army in Africa and waiting for the Romans to come get you. You know? You base it out of wherever it is that you control at the time Spain, and you go get them. You make them fight the war far away from your capital. Okay? It's a truism then, and it's a truism today. You know, you don't want the bad guys coming here. You want to engage them far away. So Lee and Jackson are on the same page on this. Jackson, at, in corresponding with Lee, while Lee was um, Jeff Davis's um, uh, minion in the spring of 1862, uh, there's a great quote by a Charleston paper that said, uh, oh great, Robert Lee, a full general who was in command of this department, is now a clerk in an orderly. And one of the Charleston papers said that. Well, anyway, um, um, so Jackson has tremendous success in the Valley. So Lee has all this hope that, okay, we're going to bring the Valley Army onto the peninsula. We're going to reinforce Jackson by at least another division for this big sweep end run around Fitzjohn Porter's and McClellan's flank. Okay. But every time that Lee plans a turning maneuver in the seven days that Jackson is to implement, Jackson fumbles it, okay? And so <clears throat> he fumbles it at Mechanicsville. He fumbles it again the next day at Gaines Mill. Two days later at Savage Station, okay? The day after that at White Oak Swamp. It's always falling short, always not doing what, had, what has been ordered. And one of the things that's most mind-blowing was when Bob Chilton, the chief of staff, uh, was taking an order to Jeb Stewart to, to, during the seven days, the, the, the Savage Station Day, uh, the 29th, um, about capturing bridges. He made the effort to stop and explain to Jackson, here are the orders. You are to read them. Because, Jack, because it's coming from the boss. Okay? Bob, Bob Chilton's not going to do this on his own. You know? Here, you, read this. You know? Okay, you understand? Yes, I do. Okay. You know? He goes on to see Stewart. And then, rather than repeat to him, because you can't insult a southerner like that about, you know, <laughs> Jackson decides in his own mind what that all means. I guess he was so sleep deprived that he just couldn't think straight, okay? And uh, so when the seven days ends, Lee is very, very disappointed in Jackson, very. 
because you could see it in the immediate reorganization of the army after the seven days where Jackson's command is reduced back to his original two divisions of the Valley Army and Pete Longstreet is given everything else. Seven divisions goes to Longstreet, two divisions to Jackson. And then when Longstreet and Powell Hill get into this life and death argument, the way to solve that in Lee's mind was to send Powell Hill to Jackson, okay? Put, put Powell Hill under Jackson's command, which he did. And those three divisions are the ones that went to go deal with, initially with John Pope, and they met uh, the advanced elements there at Cedar Mountain, okay? But it gets back to the boss that Cedar Mountain was a close run thing, and that it was Powell Hill that saved Jackson's banking there. Well, by the time Lee gets to Second Manassas, and after the campaign is over and all the after acts reports come in, he finds out that at Groveton, um, even though Jackson had twice as many men as the Federals, he had this remarkably unimaginative battle plan and didn't fight the guys very well. He was heroic in his defense against uh, the Federals at uh, the first day at Second Manassas. Truly magnificent, okay? And the second day, he has 19 brigades. He's got nine on the front line. He's got 10 in reserve. And after the guys, the nine in the front line on the second day fight it out, and Lee sends the orders to, okay, it's now time to advance, and he could have just simply advanced with the second line and passed the lines to put the pressure on the Federals so they could not transfer troops and throw them in front of the meat grinder under, bit, under Longstreet. Jackson doesn't do that. So Lee's disappointed in that. Um, he, um, he thinks Jackson handles the Harper's Ferry operation wonderfully, even though he expected him to clean up the mess a lot sooner than that, but that might have been unrealistic on Lee's part to think that Jackson could have done that much faster than he did. Um, but I think what um, really convinced Lee that Jackson was not his battlefield um, guy like Longstreet was, was Sharpsburg. Because in, in, in less than an hour and a half, Jackson's wing is folded up like a cheap suit by, um, by Joe Hooker. Almost identical numbers of men. And Joe Hooker just slams him. Okay? And uh, within an hour and a half, he's already called for his reserve division under Hood. And on the, on the uh, heels of Hood being called, Jackson then sends Sandy Pendleton to the boss to say, I need some more help. Okay? And Lee, when he got that, couldn't believe that Jackson in an hour and a half had been just just eaten up like this. He goes over there, sees for himself what me, what the mess is, and then he orders Lafayette McClaws, which is at the which is the reserve division of the whole army, to come to to the north side to save Jackson as well. Okay, so you add all that stuff up together. Okay, and you come to the the thought. Well, I, it goes on. You know, Fredericksburg, Jackson leaves an 800, 800 yard wide uh, gap that George Gordon Meek goes right into and really, really starts putting the knife into the Second Corps pretty badly. At uh, Chancellorsville, Jackson, uh, after a brilliant flank march, doesn't deploy his guys very well. And as a result, they get, even though with the, uh, the underbrush being what it was, it could have been, it could have been deployed much differently that made sense, but it wasn't. So with Jackson's demise, you know, there the whole thing goes. So well, he would he made a difference at Gettysburg? I think the answer is, are we talking tactics or are we talking operational warfare? Okay, because um, so I think that in my heart, I believe that if Walter Taylor would have gone to Stonewall Jackson and says, the boss says that we gotta take those heights, you know, if practicable, Jackson would have known that it meant that I've got to try, okay? And that's what I believe that Jackson would have tried.
one more question. I know, Tom, you had a question? I saw oh, okay. it. Okay. Uh, you remember? Oh, you remember. Sure. Uh, that was a short <laughs> answer there today. Stuart comes in. Yeah, there's, I'm sorry there's not a, a shorter answer for that, for that Jack. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Stuart comes in at the second at 11 o'clock at night. Yep. His people have been out for eight days. Yep. Two all night marches. Yep. Horses are shot. Oh, yeah. Guys are on their asses. Yes. What's he supposed to do the next day, riding all the way around behind the entire position again? Well, uh, that's one guy's theory, not mine. Um, see, Stuart, when, Stuart, when Stuart departs the Army on June 25th, he's got 5,600 guys in the saddle and six guns, and they're the finest cavalry on the North American continent. And there's no doubt about that. Okay? Those 5,600 individuals... On the, on the late afternoon of July 2, early evening, when they maybe get back to Confederate lines, only 1,500 are mess still mounted. Okay? Now, 1,500 out of 5,600 are still mounted. And those guys are absolutely worn out. They're, they're not on the original mounts. They've got other mounts. What are they supposed to do? Well, they, they couldn't have been expected to do much. And certainly not the the theoretics of I know one author thought they were supposed to go on some big wide ride and come down behind picket and do all this other stuff. They didn't have the the physical capabilities to do that, much less the numbers. Okay. But what the key number to remember is that with Stewart's ride, he goes out with 5,600. Yeah, he loses a few guys, but what he returns he returns to the line with only 1,500 mounted. And that, that just that just ate that ate them up. Okay. Uh, I really really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you all very much.